Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, so I'm Shana Malone. I'm from the Arizona Criminal Justice Commission, and um, we're one of the agencies that's spearheading a, a multi-agency and multi-effort um, prescription drug initiative across the state of Arizona. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, how we came to that decision today and a little bit about the initiative itself. And then we're going to move into the prescription drug monitoring program as well as the emergency department best practices and how those can affect um, other PCPs and other specialty in the private field as well as the pharmacy best practices. Uh, and then we're going to end the day with a little bit of information that you can give your patients um, about prevention in the home with these. So I'm going to get started, but just real quick, just so um, I kind of have a feel. Can you raise your hand if you're a pharmacist or a dispenser? Okay, good. <laughs> can you raise your hand if you um, are a PCP, a primary care physician? Okay, um, how about other specialty providers? Dentists? Nurses? Okay, good, okay. <laughs> EDs? Who am I missing? So if you weren't one of those, um, where are you from? Just so I don't have to go around the room and, and ask every single person. Go ahead. Yourself. Just yourself, okay, just interested, okay. Southwest Behavioral Health. Southwest Behavioral Health, okay, great. Glad to, glad to have you here. West Avapai, right? West okay, treatment? Okay. Juvenile probation. Okay. Great. great. Wow. <laughs> okay. A treatment as well. No. Okay. All right. All right. So hopefully this will apply, and we'll try to make it apply as much to all of you that came from the different disciplines as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, and some of you may have heard some of this already. I'm going to go a little bit fast, just so we don't waste your time so much with the data piece, um, and get right into the meat of what we're trying to accomplish here. But um, one of the things that you should know is that nationally, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, came down in 2011 and called the deaths from prescription pain relievers an epidemic in this country. And a couple pieces to take note of there, um, that the deaths are greater than heroin and cocaine combined, but the second point is really the point that needs to be taken home here. They've now surpassed motor vehicle accidents in terms of deaths. So, it's becoming a, a growing concern. It's taking more lives than ever, and there's something that needs to be done about that. So um, the second step that we took is we, we took a look. Nationally, there's been a fourfold increase in the number of prescription pain relievers that have been sold in this country. And one of the things that we did um, was something that the national folks did was they took a look to see of all the pain relievers prescribed, how, many of that, how much of that would medicate every adult around the clock for how long. And in your county, it's three weeks. So there were enough pain relievers prescribed in Yavapai County to medicate every adult around the clock for three weeks straight. And there's a reason that we care about that. Um, <clears throat> that roughly estimates about 524 million pills in, in 2011 were dispensed for controlled substances. Yavapai County accounted for about 25 million of those alone. Um, yeah, geez. <laughs> In terms of pain relievers, um, th they're obviously the highest percentage. Almost 60% of all the controlled substances being dispensed are for pain relievers. And of those pain relievers, two of them are accounting for almost everything. And that's oxycodone and hydrocodone. They're accounting for the biggest chunk of that pie there. <clears throat> and the reason why this matters um, to those of us that are looking at things like youth misusing prescription drugs or folks becoming addicted and seeking treatment for a prescription drug addiction um, is that the, the more that's out there, the more that's released and the more that's available, the higher the likelihood it is that someone's going to misuse. So who is this affecting? So a survey was done in 2010 by Tempe St. Behavioral, um, Tempe St. Luke's that looked at, across the state of Arizona, the rate of adult prescription drug use, misuse in Arizona. 50% of adults reported that they had misused sometime in the last 12 months, and 13% reported misusing sometime in the last 30 days. So if you take a look there, you can see that um, clearly it spans the lifespan. So it's not any one particular age group that is misusing. So there's a lot of misnomers out there that it's young college kids, for example, misusing, or that it's senior citizens misusing. But what you can see is that it actually spans the entire lifespan. And another thing to take note of there is that the predominant drug that they're misusing is, again, prescription pain relievers. So what about your kids? Um, about 8% of kids in Arizona are reporting some kind of prescription drug misuse between pain relievers, stimulants, and sedatives. This number's actually gone down a little bit since 2010, so that's a promising 
factor, but the, the non-promising factor, and the thing that we really need to consider and keep working on here, is that Arizona still ranks sixth, the sixth worst in the nation for people 12 years and older abusing and misusing prescription drugs. So in Yavapai County, um, you stand third highest in the state, and that's one of the reasons why we're here today. Um, Okay, so again, uh, there's a story here about prescription pain relievers again. So your youth in Yavapai County and the state of Arizona stand pretty comparable in terms of sedatives and stimulants, those kids that are misusing sedatives and stimulants, but your head and shoulders higher in terms of your youth that are misusing prescription pain relievers. Again, and um, this is kind of a big one for us here because in the world of prevention, when we think about, um, you know, especially substance use prevention, there's a couple of different methods that we can use, and one is to shut down the pipeline, um, and the other one is to do a what we call a risk reduction approach, approach. And if you look at that last statistic there, it should be pretty obvious to see that um, kids aren't getting prescription drugs that they're misusing from dealers, from junkies on the street. They are getting them right out of their homes. They're getting them out of grandma's medicine cabinet. They're getting them out of mom's purse. They're getting them from the kitchen counter where they're being stored. So when we think about this, that becomes a point for us of we have to do something about that, especially when it comes to youth and how easily available these drugs are to them. So what is this costing us? So um, if I didn't sway you on how pervasive the problem is or even the kiddo piece, um, this one might touch you a little bit because this one affects your pocket. Um, in terms of the morbidity and mortality rates, there's been a pretty dramatic increase in both uh, emergency room visits for opioid abuse and dependency, as well as the rate of deaths due to prescription pain relievers um, in the state of Arizona. Uh, in Yavapai County, your opioid dependency in the ED for 18 to 25 year olds was the highest um, in the entire state of Arizona. The second point there is that of the deaths that happened in Arizona, um, at least six confirmed in that year were from Yavapai um, under the age of 24. And six may not seem like a terribly high number to you, but the question becomes, how many kiddos can you lose before we have to start paying attention to this? So when we take a look at um, who's paying for those emergency department visits, um, you're paying for about half of them. So about half of them are being paid for by the access system. In Arizona, that means your tax dollars are paying for them. So that's another thing that you should keep in mind. The CDC is estimating that the prescription drug epidemic is costing us about $72 billion a year. And in the state of Arizona, we can roughly say that we know at least about $127 million is due to visits to the emergency department um, for drug poisoning. So it's definitely coming out of our pockets in that rate. Um, for those of you that are pharmacists here, how many, raise your hand if your pharmacist has been robbed. When? Just one, you're lucky, very lucky, um, because we're seeing a, a pretty rampant increase in uh, pharmacy robberies over, uh, across the state of Arizona. So that's another reason why, um, it's a safety issue, it's another reason why we wanna take a look at this. So let's think about some of the things that, are, that we think are amplifying this problem. Um, first and foremost is this perception of safety. So if you talk to an average kiddo about um, prescription drugs, they, one, they won't, uh, half of them don't even consider it a drug. They, they think of it as medicine, it's sanctioned, it's safe, it's made by the FDA, it's sanctioned by the FDA, sorry. And they don't see it as something that is dangerous. They don't see it as something that's similar to cocaine or heroin. Um, they see moms and dads and grandmas and everybody else take it, so they, they've been kind of desensitized into this. It's really not that big of a deal. Parents, as well, um, have something similar that um, I, I've heard a lot of parents say, well, at least my kid's not shooting heroin. Um, for those of you that are pharmacists in this room, though, you know that there's some pretty common similarities between heroin and, say, oxycodone, for example. And when you would ask a parent about heroin use, they would um, rattle their heads and shake um, terribly about the thought of their kid using heroin. But when you talk to parents about the notion of their kids starting out using oxycodone, it almost doesn't um, register for them. So it's something that definitely needs to change. And part of um, what you heard me talk about easy, earlier was the ease of access that um, kids have to these prescription drugs. And so part of that is that we haven't done a very good job at instructing um, the health consumer about proper disposal and storage. 
um, about what is the right way to get rid of your drugs when you're done with them. Don't keep them in your cabinet, don't save them for the rainy day, and certainly don't keep them out in the open. So that's some of the stuff that we're working on in this and that we'll talk about. The second one, and this is um, directly related to you all here today, for those of you that are prescribers and dispensers especially, um, this is the use of the, the Arizona Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. So um, we're lucky we have Dean Wright here from the State Board of Pharmacy today to take you through a tutorial on how to use it and what it's intended for, how to log on, all of those things. Um, we're hoping that, actually I'm gonna put you all on the spot. Who here is not signed up for the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program? Just one? Be brave. <laughs> okay. We're hoping that for those of you that aren't signed up today, that you do sign up um, by the end of today. The reason that this is so important is twofold. One, using the prescription drug monitoring program um, not only decreases your liability as a prescriber and a dispenser because you're able to see if in fact this person is getting multiple prescriptions from multiple doctors um, for in, and drug interaction effects, but two, it protects um, the patient as well. So it's, it's really a good system to be used for this and Dean's gonna talk a lot about it so I'm gonna leave it at that. But only 20% of prescribers in Arizona are using the PDMP right now. A big hurrah moment for Yavapai is that 30, almost 35% of you um, are using it, but that's, we still have a long way to go. We still need 65% of prescribers and dispensers to sign up um, for the PDMP. So again, it's a huge push of ours. Um, so we talked about um, this whole thing about imbalanced dose diagnosis um, at an expert panel that we held earlier this year in terms of trying to figure out some of the things driving this problem. And, and part of that was this discussion about when and where and what to prescribe. And I'm gonna actually leave part of that to Tomi um, when she talks about some of the best practices. But it's definitely a concern and an issue when we're hearing stories about 15-year-old girls coming out of um, either a PCP or an emergency department that are prescribed a three-month supply of oxycodone for a stomach ache, or we're hearing about um, people getting wisdom teeth extractions and getting um, a 60 count of oxy 30 milligrams. So it, it's one of those things, um, and especially with that, and then the, the lack of education and in, in, inconsistent prescribing. Those of you that are practitioners in the room probably um, know better than anybody how this kind of came down the pike, and that's, um, you know, a, a little over a decade ago, you were told that you weren't assessing pain well enough. Um, you were told that you needed to do a better job of making sure that that was part of your diagnostic routine. And so we saw this kind of huge paradigm shift where um, we went from maybe perhaps under prescribing to now perhaps maybe prescribing a little bit too much. So um, the take home message that, that I really hope that you get from this is that no one is going to stand up here and say, stop prescribing. No one is going to stand up here and say that especially pain relievers don't have a valid use, they do. And no one will ever stand up here and say, let's go back to the dark ages and not treat our patients the way that they should be treated. I think the take home message here today is we gotta find a balance, that it needs to be about responsible prescribing. Um, and that leads me to the last point, which is um, the health consumer themselves. That we can talk a lot about what doctors are prescribing and what's being let out the door in the dispensers, but the other piece of this pie is the expectation of the health consumer, which right now is very much uh, quick fixes and immediate gratification. And those of you that are seeing patients, you know this, that that's what they want, it's what they expect, and they're irritated with you if they don't come out of there with that. And so part of this initiative has to, to be working um, to change that social paradigm, um, that expectation of the health consumer. So, um, most of you here today are prescribers, so we're going to talk to you on that vein of it, but just know that we are out there in the community trying to work with the health consumer as well to, to balance this issue out. So in terms of this um, initiative that we started, so you should know that just a little bit of a background of it, that, and I can sure, if you want more history on this, I can sure give it to you, um, that this came down from the, the National <laughs> Office of Drug Control Policy first. And then um, a lot of it was emulated from the Washington State model that's being implemented pretty successfully. Um, what we did here in Arizona is we took a group of folks that were interested in this and we invited them to an expert panel. And they came from three major kind of walks of life. One was law enforcement. Um, the other was the kind of prevention and youth prevention piece. And then, of course, the medical piece. And that included um, both prescribers and dispensers as well as 
um, a host of other people, insurance companies were involved, um, state boards were involved, a lot of people were involved. We brought them all together into a room and we took those ONDCP guidelines and we said, okay, what's gonna work for Arizona? And then what we wanted to do um, before we went statewide with this, not knowing what does and does not work for Arizona, was to do a pilot project. So we picked three counties um, based on the severity and the need and the capacity. And that was Yavapai, Pinal, um, and now we're in the graham Greenlee kind of conglomeration together. Um, again, so your county was chosen as a result of two very primary things. One, you have a, you have a need for it. Um, it's clear in the data that you have a need for it. But two, the capacity that you have. Um, I've been working with, I'm gonna embarrass Marilee a little bit here, I've been working with the Matt Force folks, that's your local community substance abuse coalition. Some of you may have he heard of them before. If you haven't, get familiar with them because they're a great group of people. Um, they asked me to come up a couple of years ago and um, as soon as I left, um, I got on the phone to my boss and I said, if you want a textbook example, of collective efficacy in a community, go up and see those folks at Matt Force. Go up and see Yavapai County. That's how impressed I was with um, the way that you guys do things up here and the way that you work together. And um, that was one of the reasons what we wanted you as a pilot, to be honest with you. Yes, you have a very severe problem, but I also think you have a little bit of magic um, that the rest of the state can learn from in terms of how we can all work together from multi-disciplines to come together and kind of solve this problem together. So. That's my little spiel for <laughs> yeah, my county and that, of course. Um, I'm going to walk you through these just real quickly, um, just because we have a lot to cover today. Again, um, everything that you'll see today, all the materials, you can have access to this if you want um, a copy of this. Um, we have five major strategies involved in this initiative, and I'm going to take you through each one. Know that one and two are probably the ones that um, apply to you first and foremost, and that's going to be reducing the illicit acquisition and diversion of prescription drugs and the education of prescribers and pharmacists about these best practices that we'll be talking about a lot today. Um, so in, in terms of that reducing acquisition and, and diversion, um, again, we have some, some pretty core action steps that we wanna take there and that's to get these, how many of you have heard of permanent drop boxes? Okay, just a few of you, this is gonna be important for today. So. Um, usually there's a national take back event that DAA sponsors a couple of times a year, right? Um, and that's where when you have um, excess prescription drugs that are old, outdated, or just you didn't use because you had way too many of them, um, it's a place that you can take them to have them safely disposed of, i.e. they are incinerated. Um, and you know, one of the things that was a concern was if we don't want folks having these hang around in their homes, then we can't be waiting for months on end to have these take back events. And so the solution was to get uh, permanent drop boxes in your police substation. So there are now five in place in Yavapai County and then seven more to be installed soon. I'm, is the postcard up on that? So Marilee um, put some postcards up on the table there and I encourage you to take them and hand them out to your patients as much as possible. They have the actual locations. So when you dispense a controlled substance, um, whether it be from the pharmacy or whether it be you're the one writing the prescription, um, we urge you to give those to your patients to let them know. They don't have to wait for those big take back events. And we'll talk about some other pitfalls with the proper disposal and what you should never do with them But in just a minute. But it's a really good take home um, for your patients to have. And, and the folks at Matt Force and the law enforcement um, folks especially have been working really, really hard on getting those up. In terms of proper storage, this one's a little bit more tricky um, because we certainly don't want them to be keeping stuff out in the open, again, in purses or on kitchen cabinets or in unlocked medicine boxes, but not everybody has the ability to have a, a locked box or a medicine box. We've heard some stuff from seniors about how hard that is for them to get to their medications if they have that. So the take home message here with that is just don't keep it out in the open. Um, and in increased use of the PDMP, and again, this is really Dean's kind of turf, so I'm gonna let him talk about it, but we do actually need to get an increase in the people signing up and actively using the PDMP. The other thing that we wanted to do was um, a, a feedback system for you all, and so for those of you that are prescribers, um, how many of you have gotten something like this in the mail? Okay, good, yay. Okay, this is um, a prescriber report card, and basically what this is, every prescription that you write um, that gets dispensed both in terms of the number of prescriptions that you write and the number of pills that go out in those prescriptions as well as the number of days. 
um, gets logged into this prescription drug monitoring program. Regardless if you're actively using the site or not, it all goes into this system. And so what we thought would be great for you was to just give you a look at your own data um, to show you over the course of the last year, um, in terms of the drugs of, that we're primarily interested in, which are oxycodone, hydrocodone, benzodiazepines, and carisoprodol, the latter two because of the interaction effect with the first two. Um, we thought it would be a great idea to give you a look at what you've been doing and where you stand relative to other providers of your type. You should know that this is just for you. Nobody else sees this but you. Um, it's for your information and really the, the purpose of this um, is to give you an idea of where you stand and if you are considered what would be called an outlier, which is you are prescribing above what the average, for example, primary care physician prescribes, if you are prescribing above what the average emergency room doctor prescribes, it gives you a point to self-correct for you um, if, in fact, that's relevant to your clinical judgment and your practice. Um, strategy two, and this is what we're going to do today. Um, so this is educating the prescribers and the pharmacists about uh, best practices. And again, these best practices that we're going to show you today, both on the prescriber side and on the dispenser side, were devised by your colleagues. So this wasn't some statistical data research person sitting at ACJC devising these up. These were actually you guys um, that came together and said, okay, here's, here's what we need to do. Here's what's going to work for Arizona. So I want you to keep that in mind as we move forward with this. But the two pieces with that is, um, you know, what, when, where, and why should you be prescribing um, to be consistent with treating your patients? Um, and then the other part of that, like I said, is the patient education piece. Um, some of you, um, we talked a lot about this recognition system for responsible prescribing because obviously you guys are very busy. Um, you have a lot on your plates. You have a, a huge client load. And um, we talked about, well, what incentives can we give you um, for actually participating in this and doing what we're asking of you. And um, we're still working on that. I just <laughs> throw that out there. We haven't forgot about it. We're definitely still working on it. And, and if you have any ideas, um, aside from monetary reimbursement, which we haven't been able to get any of that, we, we talked with MICA, the liability insurance provider. Um, we've also talked with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield and United Healthcare about some of those options, and we haven't really gotten some great responses with the, a monetary reimbursement. So, um, but if any of you have any other ideas about what would be a good motivator or um, you know, an incentive for more doctors to participate in the PDMP as well as practice these best practices, we sure would love to hear those. Um, for the law enforcement folks, this is really, again, um, the position that law enforcement is taking on this, especially those from the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Unit and the National Pharmaceutical Initiative, is that this is not a law enforcement issue. Um, the, what happens as a result of the misuse becomes a law enforcement issue in terms of the crimes that are, are occurring as a result of the misuse or the robberies, et cetera. But, their position is that this is not a law enforcement issue, so it's not that they're all out to arrest you. That's not what's happening here. What they're trying to do is do a better job at um, tracking prescription drug-related crimes over time so that we actually know how pervasive these are and what's happening with them. But I did want you to take that message home that um, the law enforcement involved aren't out to get you in this, that they definitely want to work with you and that they definitely want to do what they can on their part so that you all um, can solve it um, in your community. And then the last two are really about the youth and parent prevention, and that's really about in, you know, like I said earlier, the, one of the biggest problems with this is that kids and parents just do not see these as risky at all. Um, and that's one of the things that we have to change out there um, in the communities and in the minds of our, our youth and our parents. And the other thing is a, this is a kind of an age-old prevention thing, and for those of you that do prevention, you, you may have heard this before, and this is about teaching resilience. Um, so not taking it for granted that kids will know what to do if they get themselves in a, a position where their peers or their friends or other family members are encouraging them to misuse prescription drugs. So those are our two, those two factors together are our two prevention strategies. Um, we are evaluating this um, to make sure that we can demonstrate both the feasibility that this can be done as well as the efficacy that what we're doing works. And again, the idea is that we take what happens in Yavapai County and how you came about doing it, um, and as well as the other two counties, and we build a story to tell the rest of the state of Arizona how you do this, as well as the feds. So there are a few states that are, are working um, on the prescription drug abuse initiative kind of vein 
Um, Arizona is um, very, we're, we're pretty cutting edge in terms of using a multidisciplinary approach and the kinds of things that we're doing with that. And um, just know that when you walk away from here today, whatever steps you take to help in this is actually going to make the case for us to become a national model um, in terms of how you do this. Okay, so that's our little slogan. If you've ever seen any of the Matt Force um, materials out there, you might have seen this before. Some of you are shaking your head, nodding your heads, yes. So you've seen this out there before. Here's some contact information of some of the folks involved, and some of them are actually here today. But again, if you want any more information about the stats or the data, um, any other th part of that, just let me know. I'm going to pass it over in just a minute to Dean to do the, the PDMP, and then we're going to talk about the ED best practices, and I'll come back with the pharmacy best practices before. Good morning. I don't know whether all of you know me or not. I'm Dean Wright. I'm with the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. I'm the, the director of the program. I've been with the board for over 20 years. And so uh, what we're going to do is, is quickly do some, uh, go through kind of quickly about the program. I'm going to skip through real fast because I want to get to the part where we're going to actually go in and actually uh, pull up go on online and show you how to actually do a query, okay, live. And so uh, basically, uh, as you all know, we, we were required by law in 2007 to start a monitoring program. And uh, obviously, we're not the first state to do it. Uh, we were surrounded by states uh, before we got ours in. But there are now 49 states. There's only one state in the nation left that doesn't have a program, Missouri. Uh, and so uh, eventually we'll have the, the entire country covered. We're required to collect data on all Schedule II through IV control substance prescriptions, put it into a centralized database uh, to help law enforcement practitioners, pharmacists, uh, to be able to identify patients who are misusing and abusing, stop that, and identify people who actually <coughs> are diverting and get that stopped by law enforcement. These are the people who we can actually give the data to. And so basically we started in 2008, right now, as of yesterday, 2,436 practitioners, that's 20% of the state, have access to the database. 31% of 1,928 pharmacists have access to the database statewide. 82% of queries are done by practitioners, 17% are done by pharmacists. Only a minuscule amount of the queries being done are done by law enforcement and the boards. And so the queries are being used by, it's being used by the people who need to be using it. That's your practitioners and pharmacists. That's the actual raw data. So practitioners are, are, are creating queries at the, at the tune of over 1,900 queries per day. And pharmacists, uh, over 400 queries per day are being done live right now as we speak. So how do you get access? So to get access to the database, as a practitioner or a pharmacist, you go to our website, www.azpharmacy.gov. When you get there, you click on the Prescription Monitoring Program link, which brings you to this page. And this page has a lot of information on it. And one of the big things is if you want to get access, okay, you go down to the link called Get Database Access. And then that brings you up to people who can request to get access to the database. So either a medical practitioner or a pharmacist, the patient can get access to their own data. Healthcare boards and law enforcement can get access. The boards, patients, and law enforcement do not get direct database access. Okay? They get what we call indirect. They can get a username and password, the patients can, but boards and law enforcement can get a username and password. They can do a query, but that query can't be released to them until they provide us an affidavit that they have an open investigation or complaint on the person they're requesting data on. Okay? So, so there's a there's a firewall there. They cannot get direct access. Practitioners and pharmacists get direct access. When you get a username and password as a practitioner or as a pharmacist, you can then go in and look up your patients. Okay? Real time. And so how do you get that? You click on for either a pharmacist or a practitioner. You'll click on that link, and it brings you to a page where you then, there's instructions and a link for you to go in and get access. It tells you what you need to do to, to get to the online form to request access. So if you click on the link, if I can find the link, there it is. <coughs> click on the link and you put in, what it tells you in the instructions is you put in new account, 
N-E-A-C-C-T, and you put in the password welcome, the word <coughs> welcome, all lowercase. And that gets you to our online form. All you have to do is fill this form out. Okay? So as a practitioner, as a pharmacist, you fill this form out. Last name, first name, date of birth, where your practice site is, the address, city, state, zip, your type of practitioner, pharmacist, MD, DO, MP, NMD, PA. Put in your license number without any letters, just the number, and the, your state, what state you're from. Now, non-resident practitioners can request access to our database too, okay? If you have a state license, you don't have to do anything to fill this form out. If you're a non-resident, say you're working for the VA or the Indian Health, and you're licensed in another state, but you're working here, okay? You can still get access, but you have to print out the forms and have them notarized the old way, because we still got to have your original license, copy of it, original copy of your driver's license, got to have that notarized form if you're non-resident, okay? So that has to be sent in after you fill this out and print it out, you have to mail it in to us still if you're a non-resident. Then once we verify the licenses and everything, then we'll actually give you your access. Whereas if you're a resident, you, don't, you have an Arizona license, this is the only form you need to fill out. You put in your DEA number of your practitioner. You don't need a DEA if you're a pharmacist. Put in your phone fax. Put in your email address. And you click on submit. After you read the statement, the liability statement, you still have to do that. You click on accept submit. And you're able to print out the form. Question? Right now, looking at the statute, the only people who can get access are people who are authorized to prescribe or dispense. That means a practitioner or a pharmacist. Those are the only ones who can get direct access. Right now, it's a statutory change that would be required to get anybody else. You have to be someone who has prescribing authority with a license and a DEA or who has dispensing authority with a license. And so that's the only people who, who we can give that access to, okay? Uh, and so and, unless they get defined as prescribers by our law, we can't give access to them. And so once you submit this form, okay, we will see that you've submitted the form. And then we're going to turn around and send you an email from a site called careermap.net because we have an online training course for prescribers and dispensers that walks you through how to actually use the database, okay? And so you get this email. You need to go in and take the tutorial. It takes about 15, 20 minutes to go through the training course, explains how to actually use the database. Once you complete that tutorial, we get immediate notice through email that you've completed it. Then we go in and activate your account and send out your actual access. That comes in the form of two more emails. And that comes from our staff at HIDINC.com. The first email will have your username, the web link for the actual database. The second one will have your PIN number, which is important in case you forget things. It'll have a temporary password for you to use, login instructions on how to use that temporary password to then create a permanent password, and then get into the database and start looking up patients. There's also an 800 number in that second email in case you have difficulties logging in, okay? And so that's the process for getting access to the database. Something to note for prescribers, for practitioners. Before you can do that form, you have to be registered with the board of pharmacy as a practitioner. State law requires if you have a license and a DEA in this state, you're required to register with the board of pharmacy as part of the prescription drug monitoring program. So you've got to register first, and then you can request access. So we go back to this page, there's a registration renewal link. So you should have already been registered if you've been in the state since we started this program, because we registered every practitioner in the state in 07 when we started the program. We took the DEA database list, and we sent out a registration to every practitioner in the state. Anyone who's come on since then may not have gotten registered, but they should have. 
Okay. There's links on each, each of the board's healthcare board sites that they need to be getting registered to our monitoring program. But you click on the registration and you'll be able to register if you're not already registered. If you don't know whether you're registered or not, you can always call me and I can look it up and see if you're registered or not. But if, if you go in and do the online access request and you're not registered, guess what? We're going to tell you you've got to register. <laughs> so we'll send you a note either by email or by phone saying you've got to register first. So let's get you registered and then we'll complete your access request. And then you're going to have to log in. So then you have to tell it I want to log in. And then you have to put in your username. I've already put in my username and password, by the way, so that's why it came up. And so then when you put in your username and password, here's the main page for the website. Okay? There's instructions if, if you need remembering how to use the system. It's called report instructions, how to actually go in and look up a patient. Okay? And then the next one is practitioner pharmacist query. That's where you make a query for a patient. You're going to look up a patient. We have the ability to do a multi-state query. We are connected with the NABP's PMP interconnect hub. Right now there are eight states hooked up to this hub. There are 25 states that have signed MOUs with NABP to join that hub. There are, another, or there are, up to, there are over 12 now that uh, are in the process. There are eight that are live right now. There's another four that are working on be becoming live. There's only one state that right now that connects us that has access. That's New Mexico to this hub. The closest state after that is Kansas, and then it just goes further east. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> but Utah, Colorado, uh, Nevada, uh, Idaho have all signed up to join the PMPI. Okay, so, do, so you would be able to do a multi-state query. If you know your patients from Michigan, okay, and you want to be able to see what they obtained in Michigan, then you could do a multi-state query and look up them in Michigan as well as looking up them in Arizona and get the data all at the same time. And I'll show you how to do that. But first to do just a normal query, you click on pharmacist practitioner query. The first thing you have to do is be able to accept the conditions for your liability, okay, the fact that you do have the right to get in here and look up patients, okay? I certify that the person I'm looking at is someone I'm treating or evaluating, okay? And so you're going to do that. If you don't click accept, you don't get into here, okay? So you have to be able to state that, yes, this is someone that, that's my patient. There's four things you have to put in. You have to put in. You're required to put in. At a minimum, you've got to have a last name, first name, date of birth, and you've got to have time frame for your search. That's the minimum that you need. That's the minimum that I suggest you use. Don't go outside. Don't go over and put in uh, addresses. Don't change it to another county. Don't change it to zip code. Don't put those in, okay? Because you're going to limit your search when you do that. I don't even change gender, okay? I'll leave it at all. You don't know how many times I've seen pharmacies put in the wrong gender. Where's the data coming from? The data is coming from thousands of sources, okay? It's entered by pharmacies, by dispensing practitioners from thousands of sources coming into this database, okay? I don't put the data in. Each of those sources are putting that data in. And so I can't guarantee that they might not have made a mistake by putting in the wrong gender, okay? It's, it's something that, that, that we're hoping in the future, yes. Right now, it does a lot. There are a lot of algorithms in there in the searches that are done. But when you do a search, I recommend, okay, using last name and only the first couple initials of that first name, not the whole first name, because what if the pharmacy spelled it different than you spelled it, okay? What if, they, what if, if you're looking for Robert, you put in RO, you have a better chance of finding Robert, you're probably going to have to go ahead and search. If you know they're using Bob, you're going to have to search with a B. Okay, William, you're going to to, if you know they use Bill, you're going to have to search with a B for Bill. Because William's not going to come up if you're searching for Bill. Bill's not going to come up if you're searching for William. Okay, and sometimes, depending on the patient, you may have to do sec a second search to make sure you've got all the data. Okay, so if, if you do a search and you don't see what you expected to see, you may have to refine your search. And, and you can search last name and the whole first name that you know 
But if you don't see what you expected to see, go back and do it without the whole first name. Use just the first few letters. Yes? What time frame do you recommend? Time frame, I recommend a year. But we're going to, as of tomorrow, the, ex the exact the time frame match, you will be able to, there will be a drop down menu to allow you to pick 30, 60, 90, 180, one year, two year, three year. Real quick. Right now, it's automatically putting one in year, year for you right now. Okay, so when you go in, it's automatically got one year in there already. Okay, so it's set up for one year. There will be a drop down menu to allow you to change it to 30 day, 60 day. You do the pick. Okay, that's a new feature that's coming out tomorrow. It's supposed to go live tomorrow. Now, you, you put in your time frame and then you submit. Okay. I'm not seeing it on the screen. And maybe it's because of the way I went into the system. But I know on the practitioner side, when you, when you look at this, there is a, there's two bullets above the submit. One to tell it to search by date only. And the other is to search by uh, profile or something like that. Because basically, if you, if, oh, that comes after the next part. Okay. So we'll submit here. And then we'll get it. So it found me. There's one person in there with that name. Okay? And so there it is. Sort by date only, sort by recipient by date. Prescribers complain because you got a patient in there and you see their name in there three, four times or more. I've seen people in there like 20 or 30 times. If you don't sort by date, it's going to sort by recipient. So if you've got them in there five times or ten times, it's going to sort first by this name and then by date within that name and this by name, this by name. And your dates are all going to be mixed up. So you always tell it to sort by date only because that's what you want to be able to see is the date that the data is there. There's only one script in here, okay? So we're not going to see a whole lot. Basically, this is what you see. You scroll across to see everything across. This gives you all the data that you need. We've made a query. That query has been logged. We know every query you make. I can do a search and see every query you've done, okay, by user. So you see all the data for that person, for that prescription, for those prescriptions if there's multiple. You can generate an actual report up in the upper left-hand corner if you want paper. Okay, We're not going to print it out, but I'll generate it anyway. You click on that, and it says we've created a query. So go to View Query Status to see that query. And so you go down to click on View Query Status. That's where you go to get the physical report in a PDF format. It's, still, it's been approved. It's done. Once it turns blue, you can open it up or save it. And so when you click on it, a box should come up. There it is, down at the bottom. And so we want to open it up. And then we get this PDF document that we can print out that has all the information for that patient. Has the list of the pharmacies, list of the practitioners by DEA, the patient at the top, and the drugs in date order. The thing about the report, it doesn't have all the information that you saw on the screen, okay? And so, so, but it's nice because it has a real condensed version. It has the minimum you need, the date written, date dispensed, the name of the drug, day supply, quantity, whether it was a new or refill, who the prescriber was, who the pharmacy was, and what the prescription number was. Okay, so you have that data, okay, that you then are able to utilize. If you want to print, you don't have to print out the report to see all the data. And so that's your report, and then you can print it out if you need to. Or you can save it to your computer for later use. Now, if you want to do a multi-state query, you go to multi-state query. Again, you have to accept the statement stating that I'm looking at a patient that I'm supposed to be able to look at. The key to doing a multi-state query, always pick Arizona. Okay? Because you want Arizona data too. 
and it puts it all in one report, okay? And so you're always going to pick Arizona, and then you can control click any of the others that you want, okay? So you've got Connecticut, Indiana, Kansas, Michigan, New Mexico, North Dakota, South Carolina, and Virginia right now in the system. Others are coming, okay? So you control click on some of those states, and then you put in the name of the patient. Guess what? We're not going to get a whole lot of data here. Because I know for a fact I don't have any scripts in those other states. You have to put in a whole name here, first and last. You can't use just parts of the name. Because we're going out to, through a hub to other states, you've got to have a whole name, first and last. Then you've got to have a date of birth. So those are the identifiers you're required to have, at a minimum, along with that time frame. Okay? <coughs> so... And again, I'm going to have to change the time frame. We're not going to see any data. I'm sorry? Four digit. Uh, no, you don't have to. Uh, it will put it in for me. <laughs> uh, it, it, once I click on this, it will automatically put it in there for you. And again, you can also sort by date or sale, sort by recipient. Okay, if you change it to sort by date only, then you're going to get it sorted by date only. And you click on submit. Ah, it didn't like the fact that I didn't do that. So it will not do it for me automatically. So that's the, the funny thing about multi-state. I've only done this a couple times, so on the multi-state. So you're right. You have to <coughs> put in exactly what it said. It's not going to make any difference because there's only one in there anyway. But. So you click on it, and it's going out to the hub, and it's querying those other states, and then it's going to come back okay, and say that we have a report. And it didn't take very long. Of course, fortunately, there was no data on those other states. But you see it's plugged it by state. okay? So you've got... No data found in Kansas. No data found in New Mexico. And we scroll down. And I'm not seeing Arizona. It might, I, I might have deselected it, you're right. So, but basically, that's what you get when you do a multi-state query. And of course, if there's no data c coming back from another state, it's going to tell you there's no data, like in this case. So there was no data. Okay. And, but that's how you, the queries are, are really very simple to do once you've gotten your access. And they don't take very long. Okay. If you're searching for a whole year or two years and you know they have a whole lot of prescriptions, it's going to take more than just a few seconds. Okay. That may take you know, 30, 20 seconds, you know. Might even take a minute if it's really big. I've done some searches of actual pharmacies, actual practitioners, okay. It can take a little bit longer when you've got data, especially if you're going back a year or two, and you've got data where they're getting, they're filling hundreds of prescriptions a day, okay. Getting data on those takes, I've, I had a file on, on a pharmacy, it was, it was 32 megabytes was how big the file was. Monstrous file, okay? A lot of data, okay?
but it still only took less than a minute to get all that data and put it in, you know, from the system. Okay, so it's really a fast system. There is another key information up there, update, confirm, account info information. If you're out there and you're, you're going on to the site, you haven't been on the site in a while, you're probably going to have to do that. You will have to confirm and update your account information, make sure we have current email, current address. Uh, if you haven't already done that, it's going to be a requirement before you can actually get into the system. And once a year after that, you're going to have to do it again to make sure we maintain current info information on all our users. So my name is Tommy St. Mars. I am the um, chief for the Office of Injury Prevention with the Department of Health Services. And um, my background and expertise is in emergency medicine. I'm um, an emergency nurse. I have been in the emergency field for, I was thinking, gosh, almost 30 years now. Um, I must have started when I was three. And um, some of this is going to be a little repetitive. For my history, I've been at the Department of Health Services for seven and a half years. So state government is in some ways still very, very new to me. And coming from a hospital into state government, that was a total different animal. And it still is a different animal. We recognized in my office that um, poisonings quickly overtook and became the leading cause of death to Arizonans. We saw about a 30% increase from 2005 to 2011. And it was quite shocking. And any time something as simple as poisonings replaces car crashes, you kind of have to wake up and take notice. I recognize how challenging this issue is for our emergency departments, and the data shows that about 30% of the prescriptions that are written for opioids were coming out of emergency departments nationally. Our enforcement community actually began to take notice and started addressing prescriptions about the same time um, that the health world did. And when I say about the same time, the Arizona Substance Abuse Prevention um, Committee, it's a governor's council, started having the conversation about, oh my god, look at this. Prescription drugs is a bigger problem than illicit drugs. While they were having that conversation, I was having conversations with my ED colleagues around the fact that we were seeing an increase in poisoning deaths and how could we address it on the emergency department side of things. And my leadership said, you need to go to this ASAP group before you even um, bring your EDs together to begin talking about how do we address this. From that, um, we moved forward and actually had an emergency department forum in July of last year to discuss what best practice guidelines might look like for emergency department prescribers. And through a consensus, we took the Washington State model document, and through a consensus, we had over 50 ED docs in the room, which totally blew me away, um, from all over the state, who agreed that the guidelines that we came up with was the right way to go. Handout over there. I'm going to get Ding walking away from the mic. <laughs> You're going to have the prescription guidelines um, as your first document, and behind that are the actual slides. We finalized these draft guidelines, and I have since sent them to the Arizona Medical Association, and their public health committee is um, looking at them as well. The question was, how are we going to let other people know about this? I am waiting on the um, Arizona chapter of the Emergency Physicians logo, and I already have the Arizona Emergency Nurses logo. And we hope to have ARMA's support so ARMA's logo can go on this as well to show that the medical community does support these guidelines. But once again, we're reliant on clinical judgment of the practitioner of the prescriber. Because there's going to be patients who are outliers. And those particular patients may make the prescriber appear to be an outlier. And that report card gosh, now we're talking about prescription drugs, and we weren't talking about it now. And as a community, the communication is huge, and we're beginning to make a difference for our patients. So what do we know about that patient? Well, they need help. Sometimes they don't recognize it. They may need to be detoxed. Not only are we having a conversation with each other, 
we're beginning to bring prevention services in and asking our emergency departments, do you know what those prevention services are in your community? We know these patients can be demanding. They might have a psychiatric component. They can be argumentative. And, you know, sometimes from the emergency department setting, it's just much easier to write them a script and get them out of there. Um, they know how to manipulate the system. There, some of these patients are really, really good at manipulating the system. 30 years ago, I would be able to pick up the phone and call every emergency department within a 30-mile radius of my hospital and say, hey, we just kicked out so-and-so, and this is what they want, but the doc wouldn't give it to them beyond the lookout, and every EDE had their frequent flyer book, right? Those of you who've been in the system for a while know every ED had a frequent flyer book. And these patients actually take a lot of time in our emergency departments anymore. Five, six, eight hour waits don't have the time to deal with them. Additional challenges that they create is are they having true pain or are they a drug seeker? And you know, once again, when, with our ED forum that we had, we actually had um, pain control specialists come in and talk to us and talk to our emergency department physicians so that they would have an understanding of how that care is managed in that setting. Um, our physician, do they want to be perceived as uncaring or the candy man? Are, you know, are they a bridge? Are they a supplier? These patients actually create not just low physician satisfaction, but the nurses are frustrated. We don't want to take care of these patients. They're demanding, they're not appreciative, um, we're tired, maybe we had a bad day. Um, and, you know, sometimes they are from that no pay population. So the idea really is to treat those individuals who are having exacerbations of chronic pain um, who actually are trying to take care of themselves. You know, as with anything, we have, I, I struggled with the word outlier on the report card, because who wants to be an outlier? Well, we have those patients who are out of the outliers. It takes one or two who ruin it for everybody else, because we truly have patients who are sick with chronic pain who are trying to help themselves. But we also have those um, patients who aren't, and, you know, we really don't want to be supplying those individuals who are diverters. So I heard, you know, they peed in the cup and they're not testing for the drugs that we gave them. Um, and we don't want to be the drug supplier. From the emergency department and, and pulling together a policy for a hospital, and I'm coming at this from the ED because that's my area of expertise. I think there's pieces in the guidelines that every practitioner practice can pull from and make it applicable to their practice. But it takes a team because if there's one person who doesn't buy in on it on the team, it's not going to be successful. If everyone is practicing the same way, then we begin to change that culture. And that's what we really want to do is change the culture. We want patients to have the care. We don't want to be perceived as the supplier. Um, and we want to connect them back to their practitioner. I don't do good pain care in the emergency department. They need to go see their PCP for their good pain care. So we want to have a very high quality um, pain management framework for our emergency departments that um, really are going to look at having those patients decrease utilization of the emergency department. They need to be following up with their PCPs. They need to have their pain managed by the individual who knows them, not the, e the night shift ED doc who only works Saturday nights. So we know the emergency department's not the um, best place for chronic pain. We have to, both the physicians and the nurses, administration, um, really have that unified front. We need to use a system to track. So when we had our emergency department forum in July, what was really apparent at that point in time is all the prescribers in Arizona are registered with the Board of Pharmacy. 
In July, only 15% of the prescribers in Arizona were participating with the prescription drug monitoring program. And to me, that was a big gaping hole. We have begun having conversations in that six month time frame of how do we make that system more intuitive? I get my emergency department's busy, but I also get that my, the physician that I go see is busy as well. There's a list of patients that she's going to see, and it's much easier if somebody else can be looking up those patients and have that information ready for her when she spends her time with me instead of having to waste time, and it's, and it, 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 it is a waste time, to have to go look and then come back. We need to make the systems better, and the way we make those systems better is the users give feedback on how do we make it better. And sometimes we may have to, um, I'm in Arizona, so I hate this word, legislate it to make it better. So we have to change wording to allow others to use it, then we change wording to allow others to use it who are within the practice. So now it becomes user friendly, it's being used, and we have 100% of the prescribers participating in the system. We know chronic pain is any health condition that requires ongoing narcotic or benzodiazepine pharmaceuticals for treatment. Um, there's lots and lots of different chronic pain diagnoses that the patients are out there with. And the problem with that is, how do you know um, that I'm not having a migraine? You know, some of these are really subjective. And, and so as a provider, if the patient tells you they're experiencing these symptoms, you know, do we believe them or not? There is a perception that some of these patients may be uneducated, um, but they want to help themselves. They've been taught to use the emergency department versus their primary care physician. We know that um, some, many patients don't have primary care physicians. Um, so we need to create systems that allow them um, to be able to access outside resources. So that one of our pushes really is for our emergency departments to know what those resources are in their communities. Um, the emergency department is not a place you go for a prescription refill. And patients still go to the emergency department to have their prescriptions refilled. Um, for our drug seekers, they believe that our emergency departments are a good place where they can get the drugs so that they can do diverting. And some patients just aren't motivated. And, and I think, you know, from the PCP side, you, you too have patients who are just not motivated to take care of themselves. So the definition of drug-seeking patients um, includes recreational abusers, addicts whose dependence occurred through abuse, um, or injudicious prescription of narcotics, pseudo-addicts who have chronic pain that's not been appropriately managed. There's literature to support um, how to care for these individuals. And once again, you have a copy of the slides with that information. So our guidelines that we developed um, we're based off a of criteria from Washington State. It is a consensus document. Um, and I think really the disclaimer on that front page says a lot. We're relying on your clinical judgment. We know every patient is an individual and medicine is not black and white. And we get that. Um, it's intended to help reduce inappropriate use of controlled substances. It's not intended to establish standards of care. Once again, patients are individual. Everyone has their own individual care plan. Um, unfortunately, it's not evidence-based yet because this is new and sometimes you have to be the one to create the evidence. So we're looking at this as a promising intervention. And um, it's an educational tool and clinicians must use their clinical judgment. So guideline one. For the emergency department, we believe when possible, only one medical provider should provide the patient prescriptions for their chronic pain. I think that way then they can be adequately managed with their care. And it is a recommendation from the American Pain Society. 
We know that our ED prescribers can't manage and monitor effects of chronic opioid therapies. This is a biggie. This is the one that um, I think that we can make a lot of inroads on, and that is to begin using the prescription drug monitoring system. And if it's not working, if you work with young um, practitioners who are smart and brilliant and, and know technology and can think of better ways to make it work, have them put it down on paper and send it to Dean. I feel it needs to be intuitive, one or two buttons and you've got what you need. If you print out a report, it doesn't have your DEA number on it so that you can hand the patient the paper. You can put it in their chart. Um, so make sure you give that feedback to the keepers of the feedback system. Um, use of intramuscular IV controlled substances for chronic pain is discouraged. Um, I've just done short rational statements. You'll see in the guidelines we have fuller rational statements, um, but it should be avoided because of the short duration and the potential for the addictive euphoria. We recognize that there are some special circumstances that patients may need to have that, um, but if you, the physician, the prescriber has picked up the phone, had a conversation with the PCP, and said, hey, Joe Smith's here, this is what I got, this is what they're saying, what do you think? And the PCP says, yes, please do blah, 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 and have them follow up with me in the office in the morning. That makes perfect sense. Emergency departments should not provide replacement for prescriptions that have been lost, stolen, or destroyed. My dog ate my homework, my dog ate my prescription, um, I've lost it. Um, anyone who has, and I'm sure it's happened in the offices. So we tell the emergency departments they can actually call a pharmacist and say, was this truly a prescription that this individual had? Follow up with their PCP. But to institute policies that say, this is not our practice. The emergency department should not provide replacement doses um, of methadone for patients in a methadone treatment program. So recognizing that it has a very long half-life, um, opioid withdrawal is not an emergency medical condition, and that the prescriber should consider those patients who might have been withdrawn from a program due to noncompliance. Long-acting or controlled released opioids should not be prescribed from the emergency department. Once again, the monitoring that this requires is not within the scope of practice for an emergency department. So I think in some ways what you see is these guidelines are slowly trying to shift back what our emergency departments are supposed to do, which is deliver emergency care, and then really reinforcing to the, our patients, follow up with your primary care physician. And if you don't, then we need you to follow up with, this is who we have on call on the list this week. Patients should provide identification to pharmacies um, when filling the prescriptions. So this is currently not law. If this is important to the medical community, there are ways to make this happen. Um, we know patients who um, divert can provide a fictitious name, which is illegal. There are statutes to that. And if you look at guideline number seven in the actual guidelines, um, I've listed the statute that would require if an emergency department identified or a practitioner identified someone who was truly being deceitful they are breaking the law, they can call the law enforcement officer. We recognize that um, there are going to be some traumatic events where patient identification could possibly be problematic and that would be those motor vehicle crashes or home fires or those traumatic events. The guideline number eight is one that emergency departments struggle with. I have no idea how the state of Washington has um, handled this. We had a lot of conversation around this in our forum, um, but ultimately the consensus was to leave it in um, because once again, these are guidelines. Emergency departments can choose to do it or not, and that is to require um, photo identification for patients who come to the emergency department. And a lot of times, billing is asking for a picture ID anyway. Um, so they may have seen it and not recognize or realize that they had a picture ID. Um, but photo photography, photographing that patient really gives positive identification and actually can potentially facilitate care if they come in again because they'll have a picture ID of that individual. <clears throat> Emergency departments 
should try and coordinate care of patients who frequently visit the emergency department. And, and I know from um, billing practice in Medicare Medicaid and the way our healthcare um, world is changing, many hospitals are looking at how do I better care coordinate the care of the patients who are here a lot because they're not being reimbursed. Um, so care coordination really is contacting that primary care physician and letting them know that their patient may be overutilizing the emergency department. A lot of times, you know, I think we took this shift. We wanted patients to be part of their care. So we told the patient everything we wanted them to take back to their PCP. And we cut the PCP out of that communication loop. And I think that the emergency department, the patient, and the PCP, having that communication all the way through is going to be what, what is needed again. Um, they need to formulate an emergency department care plan. And the plans should stress the importance of seeing their primary care physician for management of their chronic pain conditions. This is an easy one emergency departments can do, and that's, you know, who in your community provide services that are non-emergent? Is there an urgent care? Is there a clinic? Um, where are the prevention resources at? Um, so that patients have access to non-emergency department type care. Because the emergency department initially was designed to care for those individuals in an emergency. Um, and the other piece that we recognize is that Joint Commission says that you're supposed to um, assess the patient's pain. It doesn't say you have to write a prescription for a narcotic or an opioid. And, and that's another piece that we're letting the physicians know. But we're also sharing this information with administration because a lot of times administration is saying, well, my press gainies are based on patient satisfaction scores. Now I have a mad patient, they're not going to give me a happy score, what do I do? It's like, well, you don't send them the press gainy. Because these are a small percentage of your overall population of patients. We think the emergency department should perform um, ESPERT, which is substance um, brief intervention and referral treatments to patients with suspected um, prescription abuse, um, substance abuse, as well as alcohol problems because it's will identify those patients who um, may be at minimal risk for bigger problems. And the patients can, t patients typically will self-identify through that process. Facilities, emergency departments that are participating in the trauma system already have to do ESPERT as part of their trauma um, recognition. Administration of Demerol is discouraged because it has um, such a long half-life and um, really hasn't been able to demonstrate um, good pain relief. For exacerbation of chronic pain, um, the primary care physician needs to be contacted. The patient should only receive enough pills to last until the office opens. So if the office is open tomorrow, they get one pill from the emergency department and then said follow up with your primary care physician in the morning. Um, we really want them to only have enough to get by. I, I think a classic story is my husband pulled his back muscles, um, went to his PCP, and he only got a seven-day supply of Flexerol. And that was it. Instead of you know, you used to would have gotten 30 days. Um, and then really to contact and follow up, you know, once again, they can follow up with the pharmacy to see did they have a recent prescription. Use a, a prescription drug monitoring program. Prescriptions for acute injuries should not exceed 30 pills. And from the emergency department setting, that's a no refill. You know, if you're writing refills, that should come from your primary care physician where someone can follow up with you, not from the emergency department. Um, and quite honestly, they should always opt for the lowest dosage and then ramp up. Um, patients, ED patients should be screened for substance abuse prior to prescribing for acute pain. Um, 
patients who are, um, have a history of substance abuse are at an increased risk for developing opioid addiction if they don't already have it. And um, from the emergency department, they should always opt for a non-opioid regime first. We want the emergency prescriber to um, evaluate the pain. Once again, use clinical judgment. You know, that's why you all went to school. You know your patients, and when you have these individuals, in the emer PCP, much like the emergency department, we rely on our gut. If something's screaming at you, something's not right, then something's probably not right. Use your clinical judgment. Um, when treating, and, and once again, you're not required to provide controlled substances. So um, to implement the guidelines, um, really, you need to make sure that there's sufficient time to do over communication, because I don't think where these are concerned, in any organization, agency practice, you can over communicate. This is our practice. This is what we want to do. This is how we're going to change the ship in the middle of the night. Um, and that communication has to be internally and externally. Your patients need to know that you're changing your practice and you're doing it because you want to make sure that they're getting the best possible care that they can get and that you recognize that they're in pain and there's some different modalities that you want to try to take them off the opioids. It's my understanding in the UK, narcotics are not used to treat chronic pain, yet we do treat, we use a lot of narcotics in the United States. I think it's important to let the community know as a whole that the, it's changing. And when we begin to change, the culture changes, and now our patients know what to expect when they come into your practices. For the emergency department, these are just um, some examples of the communication and collaboration that is required to change that practice in the hospital setting. Um, so really, treatment of the chronic pain patient in the emergency department is challenging and we recognize that. Um, I think a lot of progress can be made when we have communication and we have everybody on board to make these changes. Um, emergency physicians should not feel that they're practice, their group is not going to have their contract renewed because they're wanting to do good quality patient care. Um, all of us providing a united front that is changing and, and it really is the best patient care possible. This is an example of the poster that um, the state of Washington did for their emergency departments and this is um, kind of one of the next things that we're looking at through the Department of Health Services of developing and making available. Um, for practitioners. And then for those from the medical community, I would be, love to hear what your thoughts are or see examples of guidelines that you can pull from this that would be apl applicable to an office practice, because that's not my area of expertise. Okay, so we don't have a lot of time left here. In fact, we're running out of time by the second here, but I just wanted to take you through a couple of things real quick before we go briefly over the, the dispenser best practices. Um, and one of the things is, though she brought you the emergency department guidelines, in the take home for you all operating in the private practice world, the PCPs and the especially pain management specialties is a couple of things. And one of those is that as we make these changes at the emergency department, it's going to affect you, right? So these folks are, as you saw in the guidelines, are going to be redirected right back to you. Um, and what that means is that you have to come up with your own set of clinical judgments about what, when, where, and why you should prescribe and to whom and a lot of what you were just referring to. The other thing that could happen, we have Southwest Behavioral Health in the room. The other thing that can happen is hopefully we see um, more referrals to treatment. Um, and so <clears throat> one of the things that I want to give you is some information that DHS has put together. Um, it's a web. It's a webinar. Um, it's actually you get continuing education for it. Um, it's online. It takes about an hour. Apparently, it's very fun. It has these nice little avatars. There's an information sheet up there on the table if you want to take this with you. I highly recommend that you do this. Though it does say ED, this is applicable to all prescribers. So this is a way 
for you, she was talking about um, intervention screening and substance abuse screening. That's what this gives you. It gives you the skills to be able to do that. And again, not only because it's the right thing to do, um, but because those are the kinds of patients that you need to get um, to folks like Southwest Behavioral Health. There's a list up there as well for, um, this is from your REBA, your Regional Be Health, Health Authority. Um, and this tells you when, where, and who to go to when you do have a substance abuse that you, a substance abuse problem in your client that you can see. Um, there's also some great information. Um, I'm gonna just fast forward a little bit. So there's also some great information on here um, about Indian Health Services as well as the VA. Um, and then another sheet that we put together was a resource list for you to take with you. This is your, this is a short list of your available providers that do substance abuse treatment in your area. So if you do end up with a client that you need to refer out um, you actually have some contact information, make photocopies. We can get you this electronically if you want, that you can just hand write to your patient and say, you know, given that I'm seeing some problems here, these are the kinds of people that you need to contact. Um, all right, so let's roll into the dispenser best practices real quick. Um, these are actually still in draft form. Those of you that got a copy, it looks like this. Those of you that got a copy, um, they're still in draft form. Uh, the Arizona Pharmacy Association is taking one last look over them. That's why you see this blank spot on the page. That's where their logo goes once they officially sign off on them. The way that these were put together was very similar to the forum that um, Tommy was talking about for the emergency department. And that was we brought a group of uh, pharmacists and um, folks that taught at pharmacy schools, state health officials, the insurance companies, and a few other people came together in a room um, and kind of hashed out what they thought should be uh, the pharmacy guidelines moving forward, and we'll talk about some of the things that Robert brought up in just a second. Um, the thing that Tony brought up that still applies to this is you still have to use your clinical job, judgment. So we can give you um, these set of guidelines, but again, every case is going to be unique to the individual. Um, so let's just roll through these real quick. Um, all right, so the first one is about the, the PDMP again, and that was we wanted to come up with when should we tell you that you absolutely should check that PDMP because we know that sometimes it's not feasible for you to check at every single patient. So when should you absolutely check it? And what the group came up with was that for all two, schedule two and three drugs, it should be for every new or unknown patient. Um, those weekend or late day um, prescriptions, and again, that's because those are the ones most commonly brought in by drug seekers or doctor shoppers. Um, if you get a prescription from someone that the prescriber is far away from the pharmacy or the patient's resident is far away from the pharmacy, because oftentimes what drug seekers and doctor shoppers will do is they'll go far away from home so that nobody knows them. Um, and any sp suspicious behavior. There's another handout for you over there about suspicious behavior. I'm going to take you through that next slide in just a second. It looks like this. Um, we'll go through those in just a second. And it's not ex exhaustive, but it, it'll give you a good enough idea. Um, the next two um, are definitely clinical judgment. Um, that's if you get extremely high doses or extremely high quantities or anything that you think is an outlier um, to what should normally be prescribed. And again, you're going to have to use your clinical judgment on that. Um, the group actually did say that they thought that the PDMP should be checked each and every time that a patient presents to get a prescription filled for oxycodone 15 milligrams or 30 milligrams. Um, I haven't heard a lot of backlash about that yet, so I'm waiting for that, to be honest with you. Um, and then the regular patients once a year. So those that you know in your small town that you're referring to, that you know them, um, still check once a year, just to make sure, because a lot of times um, with certain groups of populations, they might not even realize what they're doing or where they're headed with that. And I think you can see some of that in the senior citizen population. Um, and then it was recommended that you document in the patient's file that you have, in fact, checked the PDMP to cover yourself um, in terms of liability. And that the, one of the things that really got talked about was the problem with floaters. So that you can train all the folks that are in your immediate pharmacy, but you have so much movement. And so it's really important that you have kind of a policy in your pharmacy about use of the PDMP and education on the PDMP and getting those floaters um, to do that as well. So here's a list of some of the behaviors um, that you can see at the pharmacy level when folks come in. Now obviously um, people can have runny noses and not be drug seekers, right? So people can also um, be sweating and not be drug seekers. So it's not that any one of these 
um, would give you the heads up that you absolutely have a drug seeker. But if you got a few of those on that left-hand side, that should arouse your suspicion. If you get a few of them on the, the right side, it should as well, but specifically those that I highlighted for you. If your patient is not willing to give you identification, that should be a major red flag. If your patient is paying cash most of the time, but you know they have insurance, that should be a red flag. Um, if they're presenting again at times when they know you can't call the prescriber, so they're presenting to you at midnight or 10 o'clock, and they know you can't check to verify, that should also be a, a red flag. Um, so now what should you do if you get those red flags, and when should you contact the prescriber? And this works for everybody in this room because this is that, um, that communication piece that both of you were talking about earlier. If, in fact, you think that you have a forged prescription, absolutely, you should call the prescriber first. Um, anytime you get the early refill request, especially if you're getting people that you know this should only be refilled every 30 days, but they're coming in consistently at day 20 or worse, day 7, um, kind of what she was talking about earlier. Um, high quantities from the EDs. You shouldn't be seeing that anymore. Yavapai Regional Medical Center has been implementing the guidelines that she was talking about for almost 16 weeks now. So you shouldn't see those big high volumes anymore. So that should raise a red flag for you. And again, any suspicious behavior. And again, that's clinical judgment. Um, it was recommended that if you do get a high volume of ED patients, that you make um, direct contact with the, the medical director over at the emergency department, which works in a small town or smaller town. Um, and that the big thing was that you, if you had any suspicions about it whatsoever, that if you were gonna call the prescriber, do not call the number on the prescription. Call the number that you have listed in your computer because a lot of times people will forge that number um, on that prescription and, and you won't in fact get the prescriber. You will get his best friend down the street who was waiting for that phone call. Um, the third guideline is that, again, this is when pharmacists should communicate with other pharmacists. And there was really only a couple that were identified, and the first was that if you get a prescription coming in that you know has been denied by another dispenser, you need to call them and find out why. If you yourself deny a prescription, it's recommended, and especially in a small town where you can, that you call your other local pharmacies in the area. and. Um, I know that that was actually um, a particular one that was recommended by one of your own local pharmacists um, that you do that seems to be very successful um, in the area. And as we move into the bigger areas like Maricopa County, it'll be a little bit tougher, I think, to get people to do that. But I do think that in this particular area, um, for example, Robert probably easily knows every pharmacist within a five-mile radius that he can call directly if he thinks that um, he has someone that um, is doing something with a shady prescription. But the, the one thing that came out of that um, forum that I thought was very telling and that there was such a lot of speculation about was it is not a violation of HIPAA for Paul to contact Robert about a forged prescription or a counterfeit prescription. And that needs to be very clear to all the pharmacists in the area that it, you're not violating HIPAA, in fact, to call each other about treatment. Um, guideline four was about, <laughs> again, government-issued IDs. Um, for the pharmacies, they said that it should be for every new or unknown patient before you let a controlled substance out the door. Again, we've talked it to death today. It's not a law, but it's a recommendation um, for a couple of different reasons. One, people are getting really good um, at forging and faking IDs, and two, to protect you. Um, from liability. So what we did was we put together um, a group. This was asked about a lot at that forum. So we put together a list, actually, um, of how you can identify a fake ID. This, these actually come from law enforcement um, for how you can, in fact, identify a fake ID. And I won't read for you everything on the screen there, but there are some pretty telling signs of what a fake ID looks like. Um, but the biggest thing is if you do, in fact, confirm a fake ID, you should not dispense that prescription. Um, the fifth guideline was about, again, forged, altered, and counterfeited prescriptions specifically. And again, the, the recommendation was that first you try to call the provider and see if, in fact, you can validate that right then and there. Um, if you can't get a hold of the, the prescriber or you, for some reason there's some, still some skepticism involved, there's a couple of things that um, they're saying that you should do. And the first is that um, you should fill out that FaxNet form. Um, and in the packet, there's actually the exact 
direct link to the FaxNet form, um, those actually go to the State Board of Pharmacy, correct, um, for um, alerting us about fraudulent prescriptions. If, again, if you deny one, contact your other local pharmacist. Um, here's, here's another thing that was kind of a misnomer. So if you discover a pattern, so you see, for example, um, 10 people that all of a sudden come on the same day and they are all coming from the same prescriber and you've either never heard of him before or you know that that is not his signature, that's a pattern and you should, in fact, contact the authorities, whether that be the State Board of Pharmacy, the DEA, which who will then direct you to say the State Board of Pharmacy, or your local sheriff's office um, for them to, to try to handle that. That's the kind of cases that they deal with. And this is um, the touchy one. So be familiar with your legal and ethical re responsibilities. So um, one of the things that was very clear from the DEA statutes is that it is unlawful to dispense a controlled substance that you know is for something other than a legitimate medical purpose. So again, there's going to be some clinical judgment involved with that. But the bigger thing is you're under no obligation whatsoever to dispense any prescription. Yes, you can make a client or a patient mad. Um, but it's better to err on the side of caution than to put yourself in a position, and there's a whole litany. Um, there's actually a couple of them. I won't pull them all out, but there's a couple of handouts out there about what, in fact, your liability issues are as a dispenser um, and when, in fact, you're putting yourself in jeopardy, and one of them is to dispense a medication to someone that you know is, in fact, intoxicated or is, it has an addiction problem. It actually violates the law, and it makes you very liable. Um, here's another one that came up that not a lot of people actually knew about. Um, even a fraudulent prescription is considered private property. If that individual asks you for it back, by law you must give it to them. Doesn't make anybody happy because you know what they're going to do. They're going to go from your pharmacy over to his pharmacy and they're going to keep going until they find somebody that will fill it. So one of the things that some of the, the retail pharmacies have done to try to get around this is they've started to, to stamp the back of the prescription itself. Um, a lot of them are, um, only a pharmacist would recognize what that stamp would mean on the back to say, this person has been here, we know that this is not a real prescription. It gives a heads up to the next pharmacist, don't fill this. So you, you're not legally obligated to call the police in that situation. It's advisable that you do, one, because they're just gonna keep moving from one to the next, but two, some of these folks, and some of you may have experienced this, they can get pretty emotionally volatile with you, and you don't want to put yourself in that position. So um, it, it is recommended that you do. What, what will be done about it is another story. The last one is really about the patient education piece that we've talked a lot about today, especially during your consultation, before you let them walk out the door with a controlled substance, and especially if you know that there's youth in the home. Um, you need to give them some, some basic tips, and one is don't ever leave it out in the open. Um, and two is be familiar with those take back events in the permanent drop boxes. And again, like I said, Matt Force has um, created a whole bunch of postcards up there that you can just hand right to them um, for that. If for some reason they live in a very remote area or um, perhaps they're a senior citizen that doesn't get around and going to a drop box isn't an option for them, um, then they fall back on the DEA and the FDA tips, which is to take it out of the original container that it's in, mix it with some undesirables. They usually give um, coffee grounds and kitty litter as the examples for that. Then put it in a sealable bag and throw it away. It's a lot of work, but what we don't want people doing is flushing it down the toilet because it will contaminate your water supply. And in fact, they're already starting to see some of that. Um, and we don't want them just throwing it away as well because people go through other people's trash for these. So. Um, those are the, the big take-home medications. That, and please remind your patients to not share their medications with others. We hear so many stories about um, Tommy's husband had a back problem and he had some extra and then Tommy's best friend, this didn't happen by the way, I'm just using, I'm just using her as an example, this didn't happen. And then Tommy's best friend, so something happened and they were in pain so she said, well my husband has some, I'll just give you some of these. And that's how this kind of stuff starts. And, um, just remind them that that's a considerable health risk for folks. In terms of prevention in the home, I, I've already told you that you're the third highest um, in the state for youth misuse. You're double the national average and um, one out of six of your teenagers are using, misusing prescription drugs. So that's for you and you can sure give that to your patients, especially your parents, if you really want to give them a heads up about this. 
And the key factors in this is that misperception that I talked about. They just really honestly believe that these are safe. Um, parents are less familiar with them because these, these weren't really the drug of choice as they were coming up. And again, the ease of access. But in terms of what you want to tell your patients to do, um, tell them to start getting educated about what prescriptions kids are misusing. It will surprise you. They are misusing, obviously, pain relievers the most, but um, kids go to these things called Skittles parties. Have you heard of these? They will take anything that they can find out of your medicine cabinet. It doesn't matter to them if it's a Lipitor or an oxycodone, and they will bring it <laughs> together at a party, and they will stick it in a communal bowl and just stick their little fingers in and take one out. These kids have no idea what they're taking, and they're, in, they're, they're taking multiples. They're mixing them together. And much worse than that, they're cocktailing these with alcohol, which most of you in this room know that the alcohol combined with the opioids is a recipe for a respiratory failure, and that's how a lot of those deaths are happening. That's the kind of information that your patients need to get um, as they walk out the door, and for them to talk to their kids about prescription drugs. Um, over 50% of the parents in your community we know are not talking to their kids, period, about drugs, which is something that Matt Force is working really hard on changing. But even if it comes from you to say, as a, especially as a doctor or a pharmacist, to say, don't forget to talk to your kids about misusing prescription drugs and how dangerous that is. That can go a long way. Um, obviously, the two big messages are the safeguarding, the proper storage, and the proper disposal um, for these people. We think we can cut down on a lot of the misuse, especially amongst youth, if we can just block that access. Um, things that you can give your parents, um, and again, um, all of this is available on the um, various handouts out there. Uh, things to watch out for. If they're missing pills um, out of their own supply, if their kiddo comes home and is slurring their speech and acting very strange but there's no odor of alcohol, it's a pretty good sign um, that kiddos are using. And then there's a lot of other social things too, especially this kind of abrupt change in behavior. Not just a sign of prescription drug misuse, it's a sign of substance abuse in general, which is a great thing for all of your patients um, to get. But just for them to be aware of that. And then some kind of basic tips on what they can do if they do see that. So Marilee, can you come up for just a couple seconds? Just give her just a few seconds to, to walk you through just a few of the things that she's been through. But I just want to say personally thank you very much for letting us come today and take up so much of your valuable time. We definitely really appreciate that and um, all the help that you can provide us. I just want to start with two, or end, excuse me, end with two thoughts. Um, we know this is a very comprehensive problem and that everybody in our community needs to be involved in making a dent in this epidemic that we're dealing with. And the other thing I want to mention is that MapForce is a resource for you. There are many people that are sitting out there that are involved in MapForce, but we have a lot of resources, things that have already been mentioned. We have laminated posters that we've sent out to every medical um, doctor and pharmacist that has the five take back locations will be redoing this when the, the seven new drop boxes are up so please put this up for your patients to be aware of that. Shana has mentioned a couple times the postcards that has that information. Um, we've handed out map force alerts to the medical community. The idea behind this is that you can put it in your waiting room instead of your patient who's waiting for you reading People magazine and learning about Lindsay Lohan. They can, they can learn some important information about um, prescription drug abuse and other areas with um, substance abuse. All sorts of other things that we have, little business cards that you can hand out to your patients that will make avail available to you. We're a member um, with the Partnership for a Drug-Free America of the Community Alliance Program, and they have great resources. We're happy to get them to you. Here's a poster that says, help your doctor read between the lines and you know, tell, tell you all of the prescriptions that they are taking available. We have parent packets that are available that have great resources. And then lastly, I'm just going to encourage everybody, please sign up to save lives. If you're not enrolled in the prescription drug monitoring program, please do so. It's, it's such a key component for us to be successful in this battle. And so all of that is available. We have a great website. It's mapforce.org. Um, if you'd want to be involved in any other way, please let me know all that also. And I just want to end by saying thank you so much to each and every one of you for coming. Special thank you to Dean, Shana, and Tomi for um, giving their valuable time today. So if you have any last questions, but we know people need to get out of here. So thank you very much.